Hi, my name is João Vieira and I am going to present Processing Convolutional Neural Networks on Cache. The other three authors of his work are Nuno Roma, Gabriel Falcão and Pedro Tomás. Nuno Roma, Pedro Tomás and myself are from Ines Caidi, Instituto Superior Técnico, University of Lisbon, Portugal. Gabriel Falcão comes from Instituto de Telecomunicações, University of Coimbra, Portugal. Nowadays, it is quite common having multi-core CPUs and other sorts of devices capable of a significant processing power. However, in order to take advantage of that computing power, the memory subsystem has to feed the data to the processing elements at the rate they require. This is not always true. In fact, if we look at irregular memory access patterns, we see that about one-fourth of the total energy spent is actually spent transferring data, while only 1% is spent on performing actual computation. Let's look at the particular example of convolutional neural networks. CNNs have massive datasets, plus they require to perform thousands of operations from which 90% are convolutions. Convolutions are characterized by regular memory access patterns. Plus, since the datasets are massive, data has to be transferred more than once to the processing cores. Therefore, it would be much more efficient not to transfer the data to the processing elements at all. Instead, we could perform the computation near where the data is actually stored. By doing so, we would not only take advantage of the proximity to the data, but we would also possibly enable massive parallelism allowed by the architecture of the memory device. This computing paradigm is called near data processing. Early near data processing solutions called processing in memory or PIM appeared during the 80s. However, these solutions were based on a technique called bit line processing which was extremely low level. Therefore, they were also extremely difficult to integrate in memory devices. Only much later, with the introduction of 3D stacking, the integration of these solutions became more accessible. Also, they were extremely hard to use because each solution was different, offered different functionality and naturally had its own programming paradigm. Recently, this processing solution evolved to enable analog and digital processing in reruns, which is quite popular in the context of convolutional neural networks. Some other solutions use custom hardware to perform computation near the memory devices. This may not be as efficient as bit-line computation-based solutions, as they do not enable the same degree of parallelism due to constraints in terms of hardware. However, they allow much more complex operations, since they count with discrete logic ALUs. Not long ago, processing in memory solutions and those that use custom hardware to perform computation near the memory were strictly used with the main memories. However, recently both these solutions were ported to cache, where they can benefit of a faster technology as well as data locality. The system we propose is based on near data processing concepts applied to the cache. We use dedicated hardware to perform parallel computation near the last level cache of a system. Therefore, we are able to take advantage of operands locality the fact that we can access an entire cache line at once. We have a lower latency to the main memory when comparing to the processing cores and we can use the existing cache currency protocols, which is a difficulty when we are operating near the main memory. Our compute cache system, or CCS, is integrated with an existing processing system, as depicted in the figure. The CCS acts as a slave of the processing core and is deeply coupled with the last level cache of the entire system. In case of a cache miss, the CCS also communicates directly with the main memory to transfer the data directly. This avoids evicting cache lines that might be in use by other applications, therefore not polluting the last level cache. The architecture of the CCS is depicted on the left. As we can see, the CCS architecture has the shape of a binary tree in which two elements of a lower level are fed to a functional unit that performs a given operation and generates an element of the next level. 
Depending on the functionality that each level of the CCS has to accommodate, the functional units of that level may be different from the previous level and the next level. For instance, the first two levels of the CCS have functional units that are different from those of the next levels. Depending on the command that was issued to the CCS, each level will perform a different instruction. In the end, the group of those instructions will map to a complex operation. In total, the CCS implements 47 different commands, which means that the CCS is capable of performing 47 different complex operations based on simpler instructions that are executed by each level. To better understand how the CCS works, let's look at an operation example. The example that we are going to look at is a convolution. A convolution is composed by internal products, which are implemented by multiplying two vectors element-wise and accumulating the results. First, we multiply the vectors element-wise, and this operation happens in the first level of the CCS. Then, because the second level of the CCS is a map one-to-one -one of the first level, it does not implement any operation. In the third level, we combine two elements of the second level. In the fourth, we combine two elements of the third level, and so on until we get a single element in the last level. Additionally, there is yet another level that enables accumulating the result. This is particularly useful when there are vectors that are bigger than the capacity of the CCS, and therefore they cannot be processed all at once. When that happens, those vectors are segmented into smaller portions, and each pair of smaller portions is fed to the CCS one per cycle. In the end, the last level will contain the final result of the accumulation of the intermediate results. The CCS fetches the different subvectors and processes those subvectors in an interleaved way. That way, it maximizes the bandwidth to the cache and minimizes the cycles that it idles waiting for data. Another problem that might occur is that data might not be correctly placed in memory. For instance, the vectors to be processed might not be aligned with the beginning of a cache line. Also, there might be invalid elements. To overcome this issue, the first level of the CCS features an execution mask. This mask aims at eliminating all the invalid elements that are not to be processed. For instance, in this example all the odd elements are not valid, therefore the execution mask has zeros associated with their indexes, telling the CCS not to process these elements. In this particular example, this information is only useful in the third level. In the third level, when elements are being combined two by two, there is information that the second element to be combined is always not valid. Therefore, it is discarded and the results of the third level are the valid elements of the second level. Now that we went through the architecture of the CCS, we can move to how to the CCS was validated and evaluated. The CCS was validated and assessed through simulation using the GEM5 architectural simulator. The baseline for comparison, as well as the base system in which the CCS was integrated, featured an ARM Cortex A53. Because the ARM model included by GEM5 has a 10% error rate, GEM5 was improved using GEM5X for increasing the simulation accuracy. The CCS was connected to the CPU through a memory mapped interface, and it was coupled to the last level cache. In this case, the last level cache was the L2. Because there is a virtual memory system, there was the need for implementing a second TLB and page walker on the CCS side for translating the addresses communicated by the processor. The CCS was configured to be 16 element wide. Therefore, the CCS is capable of processing two 16 element vectors per cycle. Each of these vectors is composed of 16 elements of 32-bit fixed points. Here we can see the schematics of the simulated system. In addition to the hardware model of the CCS, software support also had to be created to use it. Thus, two main software artifacts were created. First, 
a library was written in ARM V8 assembly to allow writing and reading the CCS control registers efficiently. Then, a framework using those calls was written in C to help the programmer using the CCS to accelerate workloads related to convolutional neural networks, namely the convolution operator. To assess the performance improvements allowed by our cache compute system, we tested five different synthetic kernels. Three of those kernels were one-dimensional, two-dimensional and three-dimensional convolutions. We decided to test three types of convolutions because they have different memory access patterns. By looking at the results, we can see that these different memory access patterns influence the speedup allowed by our cache compute system. The other two benchmarks are operations that are commonly executed in the context of pulling layers of CNNs. The fourth benchmark, which provided us the lowest speedup, was the max pooling operation. And the final benchmark was the RAILU operation, which provided us with the highest speedup. The RAILU operation has two possible types of results. If the input is positive, then the output of the RAILU operation will be the same as the input. If the input is negative, then the output of the RAILU operation will be zero. This is implemented in software as a conditional execution. Therefore, the CPU instructions involved in the ReLU operation take many more cycles than simpler operations like max pooling, which requires only one or two cycles. We conclude this presentation by pointing out the main advantages brought by the CCS. Because the CCS operates near where data is actually stored, the data does not have to be transferred to the processing elements. Because the CCS has access to an entire cache line per cycle, the elements of that cache line are processed in parallel, enabling massive parallelism. Plus, due to the possibility of hardware loops, the cycle control overhead that is characteristic of CPU cores is completely removed. Therefore, the performance of the cache compute system is not degraded by the size of the vectors. Finally, the architecture of the CCS is highly pipelined, and we can increase even further the number of pipeline stages if we want to match the operation frequency of the CCS to the operation frequency of another component in the system. With this, I finish this presentation. Thank you for hearing me, and I will gladly answer any question you have regarding this work.